Hello, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Poisons and Pestilence podcast, episode 27, The Sulfurous Schemes of Lord Dundonald, with Charles Stevenson. So, Charles, uh, why don't we start uh, with you telling me a little bit about the topic of the book and how you ended up uh, researching in this area? Yeah, well, the book covers uh, the 10th Earl of Dundonald's what were called Secret War Plans, early 19th century uh, conception of chemical warfare. It, it's, it's been my contention what he, what he invented, if you will, was a, a fully formed scheme whereby chemical warfare would play a part in, in um, originally it was attacking ports from the sea. In the operational sense, during the Napoleonic War, the French fleet, what remained of it, was, was uh, scattered in pockets around the coast of, of France and Spain, refused to come out and fight, so the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy, had to, had to blockade it, which was, a, as he called it, a harassing form of warfare. There had to be ships on station, all year round, tremendously resource intensive. How though do you get into harbours defended by masonry and stone forts and destroy these ships when you're in wooden ships? Laying wood before walls, as Lord Nelson himself put it, is a fraught business. The defending uh, fortifications were armed with red hot shot, shells filled with uh, with molten metal, and of course the greatest the greatest uh, danger to a wooden ship is fire. And in those days, with no efficient pumps as such, a ship went on fire. It was a huge problem. So uh, he conceived of a way of overcoming the defenders of these of these harbours and refuges by, well, by saturation bombardment and, and creating massive, massive smoke screens and sulphur dioxide screens by burning sulphur in ships, which obviously could carry hundreds and hundreds of tons of the stuff. That was the conception. That was that was the genesis of his idea of his secret war plans, which, which he put to the British government, to the Prince Regent, and there was a committee form investigated them, but they decided not to go ahead. So, as we'll see in this story, this initial idea is something that he couldn't put down. And as you say, initially there was, was pushback, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail shortly. But I guess we could start by talking a little bit about the context. Now, smoke screens have been used as part of naval warfare for a very long time, as had fire ships. Um, yes. These had also been utilised to break up, particularly to break up armadas and those types of things. But it seems that in addition to his interest in this, was it Sicily? He'd had the original idea of using salsa. Or was it? Have I got the wrong Mediterranean island? He was in the Mediterranean, I think, 1811. It was a big industry at the time in, in Sicily was, was the production of sulphur. And the way they produced it was to pile the ore up in a sort of kiln, set fire to the bottom. The sulphur itself obviously is combustible, but it would melt the other sulphur. Some of it would melt, some of it would burn. And what ran out the bottom was captured in, in damp wooden moulds, ingots of sulphur were produced. Tremendously inefficient way of producing it. And the fumes, as he observed them, rose up into the air, elevated by heat, as he puts it. But when they descended, they killed everything. Killed all life within a couple of mile radius, I think was his, uh, was his actual term. Let me quote to you. I examined the process of extracting the sulphur from the crude substances with which it is combined. The wasteful method of performing this operation gave me some surprise. But I was indeed astonished to find that the open air to leeward of the kilns was so impregnated with deadly fumes that the country people are prohibited by law from residing within several miles of the mountain during the melting season, whilst nature, by the absence of vegetable production around, seemed to warn the animal creation from the bounds of its productive range. When I thus learned the effects of these ignited masses of sulphurous ore, a gentle breeze blew from the west with the vapour Roll slowly towards the east. That was uh, what he saw. Now he, how he categorised it. 
my mind, being awake to the impressions of a professional nature, made at once an application of what I saw. But it occurred to me that if the open air could be thus deprived of its vital principle, the defenders of all marine fortifications, whether bombproof or not, might be expelled by means quite irresistible. There, he, he decided if you could, if you could actually pollute the air with smoke and impregnated with sulfur dioxide, the people inside the fortifications, whether bombproof or not, would have to leave or die. That was the basis of his whole idea. And this chat was interesting. So he was known to Napoleon. He was famous in his own right from the early years in the Napoleonic Wars. I understand it that one of his most famous initial endeavours actually wasn't as successful as intended in the sense that he would been eager to utilise, was it smoke and, and fire ships um, against a, Napo- a, a fleet that were at a harbour? And in that context, this was a, a, a classic example of he had a type of respect within the institutions, but he was generally seen as a bit of a maverick as an individual. And this scheme in terms of using fire ships and smoke was actually deemed in some respects by some a failure, but by others it was demonstrated to be a good proof of principle. Is that right? During the Battle of Basque Roads, he was brought in from the outside to attack the, the French fleet at anchor. And he conceived of uh, creating several fire ships the, the antidote to fire ships, if, if you are a defender and you see fire ships bearing down on you, you send out people in rowing boats and tow them away. But what he did was fill three or four, two, three, I think, three of them, with gunpowder, literally bursting with gunpowder. So as these fire ships approached, one of them exploded. Was, I think he said, you know, that since they wouldn't know which ones were fire ships and which ones were explosion ships, they'd stay away from them all, which they did. Now, it, was, it didn't set any of the French fleet on fire, but what it did was cause a panic. They cut their lines, and several of them went to ground. The whole, the whole defensive arrangement of the fleet was disrupted. And James Gambier, Admiral James Gambier, his, his superior officer, refused or failed to support him by sending in ships. The whole, the whole flotilla of the French fleet was at the mercy of the Royal Navy, but Gambia didn't follow it up, would not send his ships in there to finish them off. And at this point, this was the beginning of what would be many kind of scandals and, and inquiries that would relate to Cochrane. He, he said he didn't suffer fools gladly and, and seemed to be very happy to annoy people in high places. Um, then, yeah. of course, I mean, even in Napoleon's diaries, there's reference to him as an individual that, you know, did have, you know, a potential to have changed the war. Um, but apparently, you know, even Napoleon points out that he seems to have been, you know, <laughs> sold up the river by his generals in some sense. So there was this initial investigation um, to the yeah. first kind of scandal, and he basically took his leadership. Uh, was he a court-martial? I mean, Gambia was acquitted, and then, and then he got involved in the stock exchange scandal, went to South America. Yeah, this is the period where he basically leaves the UK, essentially yeah. in disgrace, makes a name for himself as a mercenary. He's he's back in the UK in, in the uh, 1840s, yeah. He's a hero in Chile, for example, where, where there are numer- uh, numerous statues and monuments to his uh, to him, freedom from uh, Spanish colonial rule, or help to. And of course, the the, the Almirante Gochlan is the name of one of their warships currently, or, or was certainly. I'm not sure if it's still the case. So yeah, he's he's a, he's a hero in in uh, in Chile certainly. Also helped in Peru and Brazil. And he comes back to the UK in part is it to take on his title when his father passes, and so quickly then he has to reingratiate himself with the establishment. Difficult, of course, because he got embroiled, as you say, in a, a scandal around stock which basically meant he had a criminal record, which sort of prevented him doing certain things. But eventually, that somehow, he'd get that wiped. So he returns, and when he comes back, what's the what's the kind of main enemy at the point he returns in the 1830s? Nobody at the time. There was, of course, uh, fear of uh, the eternal enemy France you know, during those days. There were several war scares, and again, in I think it was 1846, there was potential for conflict with France. He again put his scheme before yet another committee of the wise and wonderful 
Uh, that was uh, 1846. He uh, proposed his plan to uh, a committee of four people. And these were referred to as, it was it stink ships? Was that the kind of term that was used to describe? It was kind of a two-pronged thing, wasn't it? It was his stink yeah. ships and then the, the smoke ships, which would cover the stink ships and make it very difficult to, to sink them because you know, by necessity they'd have to be close in with a fair wind to ensure that the smoke could be delivered. Could you talk a little bit about these early designs that he was... Yeah, he, he'd given up on the, or the, or the explosion vessels no longer featured in the plan. As you, as you rightly say, there were two kinds of ships, stink ships, sulfur ships, f- ships, a hulk that had sulfur laid on the deck of fire underneath, and smoke ships to produce smoke, but with, without the toxic effect. Although, of course, all the products of combustion are ultimately toxic. And he, he proposed these for attacking, sh- for example, Sherbog, the the, uh, the cones of Sherbog, which had a famous defensive arrangement which didn't work. The port of Sherbog is a magnificent port, but it's open to the open to the sea, open to the ocean to the north. Now they they have a, a detached breakwater, have done since uh, since well, the mid mid nineteenth century. But one method they tried to use to, to defend this port was, was to put the cones of Sherbog, which were huge wooden constructions which didn't work. It was supposed to be sunk in place, ballasted with stones. And he, he proposed attacking these, should the need arise of course, because Britain and France weren't at war with his sulphur and smoke ships. A committee again looked at it, decided that the sulphur aspect of the plan were, was, was beyond the pale, but they would perhaps experiment with the smoke screens. And the beyond the pale was interesting so this was a at this point obviously this is not during you know the uh, the height of a conflict and so you can imagine that people were more willing to express ethical concerns but there does seem to be specific resistance based on the fact that this involved poison do you get a sense of what reasoning there was for the resistance to well the conclusion of the uh, committee which which Considered them in the, in the 1840s and 1846, it says we considered in the next place how far the adoption of the proposed secret plans, and they're talking about the sulphur portion of the secret plans, would accord with the feelings and principles of civilized warfare. We are unanimously of the opinion that the plans would not do so. That was their conclusion. They did not accord with the feelings and principles of civilised warfare. The use of sulphur didn't. And I guess in part it was to do with the the type of agent employed, but also, I guess, in terms of the scale of use. I mean, if you think about some of the ethical discussions in the American Civil War and the Wars of Independence, I mean, early on in that conflict, there was even rules against, you know, firing cannons at night and those types of things. There was a sense of trying to protect civilians in particular from from the extremities of, of conflict. So this then was his second major pushback. Uh, and again, this was done in complete secrecy. It wasn't publicised. Uh, it was done by him approaching individuals and, and the Admiralty directly. So then what happens? When's the next major chapter? The Crimean War. Called the Crimean War, but there, were, there was an awful lot of action went on in the Baltic. The Royal Navy sent uh, the Baltic fleet to try and take the island of Kronstadt, which, which covers... Was then the, the Russian capital, St. Petersburg. Again, a huge, uh, a huge complex of forts guarding a, a, a fortified harbour. I think they sent in the, in the region of 50 or 60 ships there. Lord, Lord Cochrane, Lord Dundonald, claimed that he could take it within a few hours with, by the use of uh, his stink ships and, and smoke ships. They produced a very detailed plan this time. Very detailed plan. On the 29th of July, 1854, Lord Dundonald produced his plans and, and laid them before the committee. They assembled at the Admiralty and entered into a discussion with Lord Dundonald respecting his plans. But it was in the first instance indicated to his lordship that we thought he might be desired us to have the assurance of perfect secrecy regarding his plans and that he would want to set them at ease on the point. And the details of the plan Dundonald explained he would require 24 old iron colliers or iron lighters. 16 of these would be fitted out as smokers and eight as sulphur craft. 
It would require to be crewed by 210 officers and men. The smoke craft would be filled with bituminous coal and other smoke-producing substances. The sulphur vessels with coke, charcoal and sulphur, some 200 tonnes of common crude sulphur. The boats in the fleet, or at least one from each ship, would be required to support the attack, but the fleet itself would not be required to join in. That was his plan. How was this plan received um, at this point? It was taken seriously. that They called in eminent scientists of the day, Michael Faraday. He said he couldn't answer all the points. Professor Faraday's reply, they'd asked him seven questions. He said he couldn't pronounce a lot of them because the data was wanting. He, he suspected that the upper parts of high buildings would frequently be free from the sulf- sulfurous vapours and that jets or eddies of fresh air from above would occur behind. He suspected that larger quantities of, of matter would be required than is supposed. So he, he, but he, he couldn't really answer the, the answer the question as to whether it would work tactically. It might well work, or it would work in, in the functional sense, as if you set fire to lots of sulfur and lots of bituminous coal and so on, you will create a lot of smoke and vapour. But whether that would actually drive people from their, uh, from their fortifications or their bomb-proof shelters... He couldn't answer. This committee again dismissed it, dismissed the plans, and of course said the application of the sulfurous vapor, independent of the barbarous and uncivilized character that would be given to it, there are very great doubts as to its efficacy. So again, we have the, the humanitarian, if you will, discuss at the the proposed use of of the other. Uh, poisonous fumes. But of course, that wasn't the end of the matter during the Crimean War. Although his, uh, the naval use of it was vetoed, but there was a change of government. Lord Palmerston came to be Prime Minister. The uh, attention moved to the southern theatre, to the Crimea, to Sebastopol, Sebastopol. And Lord Palmerston and his Secretary of State for War, Lord Panyo, were prepared to sanction the use on land rather than a naval naval operation a land-based operation of taking or driving the Russian defenders from their uh, positions around Sebastopol. And, and it's quite clear that they didn't care about the humanitarian side, the barbarous and uncivilised warfare. It was, the plan had a reasonable prospect of success. They wanted him to go and put it into operation. He says, experimental trials have shown that about five parts of coke effectively vaporise one part of sulphur. Mixtures for land service where wheat is of importance may, however, probably be suggested by Professor Harabi. As to operations done short, I have paid little attention. But he goes on to say four or five hundred tonnes of sulphur, 2,000 tonnes of coke would be sufficient. So they, were, they, they wanted to attack the southern front of Sebastopol, the Redan around the, that area. There's four or five hundred tonnes of sulphur, 2,000 tonnes of coke, would be would be laid out in front of the the redan, the southern south eastern front of Zvastopol, and used to drive the Russians from their defensive positions. This was sanctioned by the by the prime minister and the secretary of state for war, but Sebastopol fell before it could be put into practice. So it, it never was. Now whether it would have worked or not is a different story, isn't it? We we do the only the only experiments. I know practical experiments that I know of that were carried out were in the 1930s by the Swiss chemist and gas officer William Gessner, who did try on a small scale burning sulfur and coke, and he decided that given the right weather conditions and a bit of luck, it would work. And of course, there certainly was a sense in this period that chemical warfare, not that it was usually referred to as that at this point. Uh, was on the horizon. So you have the first Hay Conference of the 1890s. In the U.S. Civil War, uh, there's certainly uh, designs I've seen for chemical-laden artillery shells. So I think back in the day, rather than writing an article in the Telegraph, you'd often put a patent in and then lobby individuals to try and adopt your your weapon. I think there was certainly reference to shells containing chlorine uh, yes. and irritants such as cayenne pepper and those types of things there was also designs for balloon delivered munitions and all this i guess 
uh, fed into attempts in the 1890s preemptively codify some form of prohibition on the use of of poisons in warfare. As you say, there were many, many people who had notions of filling shells with chlorine. And I think it was one of the ones in the American Civil War was filling shells with chili powder and exploding them above the heads of the enemy infantry. So the difference that I think is most marked is that the Dundonald plans were practical in the sense that that he could have produced massive quantities of toxic smoke sulfur dioxide, he could have actually done it with, with what was available at the time. There was no sci- science fiction. And it's also, of course, it was directed towards a specific objective. This was a tactical plan yes. uh, in mind. There was a specific application in mind. So by this point, Lundonald seems to be growing increasingly frustrated, however, uh, because it seems that while there was some acceptance of his plan, Obviously, it didn't come to fruition because of the way the war went. And in later years, continues to lobby at various points for the adoption of this strategy. And seemingly, while secrecy was seen as very important, he was more willing to begin to put these ideas, at least in a kind of coded form, to Parliament and also publicly is that right he would also appear start to appear in in national newspapers advocating for the adoption oh, of his strategy the details of his of his secret war plans were were kept secret but that they existed or that there was in existence such a plan was, was often featured in the papers although nobody knew detail what it was it was supposed to be irresistible only to be used uh, uh, in a period of great emergency but well, when did he die? He died in 1860. And he passed on the details of the plans to Playfair, the old Playfair, the scientist, not to his son, who wrote about them and, uh, and examined them. Well, again, he suggested that they, they were feasible. And then around the turn of the century, the 12th Earl of Dundonald inherited them. Playfair gave them back into to the family. And he, of course... He he he, uh, he kept the secret himself. He thought they might have been at use during the Boer War, but he didn't think that was a national emergency or a severe enough emergency to reveal the secret. But during the First World War, he decided this was the time to uh, bring Dundonald's, Lord Dundonald's secret war plans again to the notice of the British government, and they ended up in front of Winston Churchill. And so the grandson, as you say, he... He was obviously very well connected and the plans or the existence of the plans, even though their details were known publicly, were certainly known in a general sense, the political establishment. Um, They had been raised in the Lords a couple of times. And they also, of course, had had some kind of formal or expert sign off and recognition that the grandson could refer to as, a you know, to keep it of some uh, validity. But he then, the grandson adopts, adapts these plans for the necessities of the First World War. And he approaches uh, Churchill, among others, at the outbreak of the, of, the, of the First World War before the real deadlock had set in. So why don't we talk a little bit about his adapted plans and the reception they received? Well, he, he approached the, the war officers, the army, and, and there are some records which show that certain senior members of the army had, had shown an interest in finding out what Dundonald's plans were, probably out of simply curiosity rather than rather than uh, any attempt to use them because they didn't know what they were. But he took his um, he took his grandfather's plans to Lord Kitchener, who, who said they would be of no use, and suggested he go and see Churchill because they were conceived by an admiral. Churchill was first lord of the admiral. See, Churchill took them seriously. Sir Arthur Wilson, who, who was who was uh, a sort of supernumerary at, at the Admiralty, he was he was asked to appraise them, and he said they were no use. The upshot was that they were rejected, that or the use of sulphur was rejected. But they made the twelfth Earl of Donald, uh, they put him on the Admiralty Smoke Screen Committee, and he did design. He actually designed a device to, for creating smoke, which was heated by oil, and could create quite a dense smoke. And in May, June 
1815, he, 40 of these, he, he assembled 40 of these at Shoebury Ness and tried them out, and they were. But interestingly, and I got the inventory of what was taken and what was brought back from the army stores in the uh, National Library of Scotland, a large quantity of sofa was also consumed on that day. Hmm. So we don't tried it out in one of his smoke smoke uh, projectors, I suppose, just out of idle curiosity, really, after all these years. But it worked. Uh, there, there's no record of what happened, but there was a, I forget the exact amount, but there was, there was several kilograms of sulfur taken out and a lesser amount brought back to the army store. So uh, he, he tried it. And it, this is a, amazingly, you sent this through to me, and I'll include it perhaps in the image for the podcast, but there's actually an image of the smoke trials. We have a one a still photograph uh, yeah. which shows the smoke being deployed. So, of course, I imagine as well, at the, by this point, there was a slightly more codified sense of the prohibition of poison projectiles and, and, and deleterious gases. You often hear that, you know, the laws of war were different and the approach to the laws of war were different back then. But there seems to be a genuine and sincere belief on moral grounds that these things shouldn't have been used. And that in part explains the resistance from the British to adopting chemical warfare first even if the means may have been there. Yeah, they, they, they would, it was considered that they would fall under the terms of the, of the Hague prohibition. Which is ironic, of yeah. course, because yeah. they, they, weren't, they weren't deployed as part of asphyxiating shells, just like the first chlorine release. Uh, they right. might have been uh, a smoke, you know, basically a smoke generation uh, travelling on the wind, which, of course, was the famous defence uh, the Germans used to defend their first large-scale use of chlorine. And so what's interesting then is at this point in history, this is where these long-term plans kind of become joined by numerous individuals in different governments around the world who had been exploring and considering the employment of, of poison gas to break the, the deadlock of the First World War. There was some suggestion in the book uh, that you explored, and I think did a really good job in investigating, that somehow the Germans chemical warfare program had benefited from the Dundonald scheme and what do you make of that having looked at this in some depth? I think there's no question that the Germans had read the Pan Muir papers because they uh, they knew about as, as you say the schemes of Lord Dundonaldson as he was mis miscalled but uh, there's an oral tradition within the Dundonald family which Douglas Dundonald the 15th Earl told me about that the, the plans were stolen by the butler of the, of the house that he lived in in Wimbledon and somehow sent to Germany, which then gave the Germans the idea for their use of chemical warfare. I can't see that that's the case. I, I mean, I believe that the 12th Earl obviously must have believed that the, the plans had been stolen by the butler. He wouldn't have deceived his own family. Obviously, this was, wasn't publicised whatsoever. But I, I don't think that the German recourse to chemical warfare had anything to do with Lord Donald. They had the world's biggest chemical industry, which now all its exports during the First World War, since the First World War, got all its export market was gone. They had huge, massive quantities of, of various toxic and dangerous chemicals, chlorine being one of them, phosgene used in the dye stuff industry. Nowhere for them to go, nothing for them to do, nothing, you know, they have nothing for them apart from possible use as a military weapon. And of course, we we'll, you know, that's a totally different subject. I mean, the Boer to chemical warfare is, of course, generally considered to be 1915 when they, when they use chlorine gas again on the Western Front. In terms of the effectiveness of the initial plans, I, I sent this through to you, but um, what was interesting was that, it's speaking our history repeats, during the Mosul offensive in Iraq, ISIS apparently set fire to a, a sulfur factory, um, which mm -hmm. did seem to slow the Iraqi advance and had widespread health consequences for locals. This was uh, the Mishrak sulfur plant. And I remember re reading about this and seeing how, you know, years later, you know, sulfur dark side made a, a reappearance on the battlefields of of the Middle East. So I thought that was an interesting kind of postscript to this. Yeah, um, 
I mean, the great fire of Newcastle in the 18, 1850s, uh, a, a warehouse full of sulfur went on fire. And the effects were horrendous. It's, a, it's dreadful stuff, sulfur dioxide. So I think it's, you know, I think it's a fascinating story. And I think one thing I've struggled with is kind of in hindsight, the, the plans, as it were, seem to be, you know, relatively straightforward and simple to the extent which you think to yourself, well, you know, what was the value in keeping them secret if, you know, to a modern eye, if given those ingredients, you know, the, the application of them seems quite clear. But I think it's worth remembering that at this point in history, this large scale chemical warfare was particularly in the early 19th century was largely beyond the imagination of many people. It hadn't been something that had really been considered before. And it's also interesting to see how the core of that idea evolved through the generations in the Dundal family and were adapted for every conflict. Yeah. Another thing that I thought was quite interesting was that if we had have seen the use of either the naval strategy earlier in the 19th century or the land-based attack, we may have seen a short period of the use of these weapons for certain tactical purposes, as in other states adopting that strategy. It may have transformed the history of, of chemical warfare. Yes, I'm sure. That, I mean, the Duke of Wellington, when he learned of the plans, famously said, yeah, but two can play that game. Of course, once you use it, use that methodology, you reveal it to the enemy, wherever the enemy may be. And what's to stop them using it back at you? It's fascinating. And of course, another line which you would touch upon in the book, but of course, how I've bumped into in looking at some of the much, much earlier history of chemical warfare is the use of sulfur, for example, in tunnel warfare. Uh, but also against fortifications, is discussed in a wide range of historical sources, most of them unreliable. They're written by chroniclers, and so you don't trust it at all. But uh, in both the West and the East, since you know the Roman times, there's been discussion of the use of sulfur in this, this way. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting uh, dimension of it. It's interesting as well that, of course, Winston Churchill, much later... Uh, during the Second World War, his views on chemical warfare are treated with some importance in relation to the prospect that of, there had been, if the prospect that there may have been use of chemical weapons uh, if a state had decided to do so in Europe. And of course, in these early years, you get a sense of his sentiments towards what he deemed to basically be an intuitive type disgust towards chemical warfare, which, in from his view, was very comparable to many forms of weapons. Um, and yeah. so that's certainly another chapter in the story of Churchill's biography in relation to chemical warfare, which before your book wasn't, I don't believe, well explored at all. Well, he, he was, he, he, he was and remained uh, an exponent of chemical warfare, Churchill. He, was, he wanted to use it in the Second World War, wanted to saturate German cities with mustard gas after the V1 and V2 attacks. That's, that's quite well known. And of course, if you'd have realised the extent of the German nerve agent programmes in that later war, we may have re recalculated. Uh, I guess that's uh, you know the that's history, isn't it? But yes. um, just just to say, Charles, I mean the book is excellent. This book has been out for a few years, and I have only just read it, and I had a wonderful time. I learned so much. It's a meticulously re researched piece of work people out there if you're interested in this type of thing go and get a copy it's great not only in relation to the specific incident but there's also chapters on the broader history of chemical warfare which i do think still today bear revisiting and pull together certain threads which haven't necessarily been fully unpicked and so there's lots of food for thought there i'm sure we'll find a reason at some point to bring you back on again i can tell you have a a fascination in this area and i wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future you don't return to chemical warfare issues again i'm glad you like the book and reviews on amazon are always very welcome <laughs> okay thank you we'll try and mobilize the listeners to do that uh thank you very much no cheers charles thanks very much that mate bye-bye